lot about place, and my students had to do observations of their favorite places. So they had to go sit in the restaurants, in the cafes, in the bars, wherever it is they hung out, and they had to figure out how do people use that space, right? So that's what observation and field work means. Anybody ever watched ER, Grey's Anatomy, any of that? Yeah? Think about the interns, right, where they're walking around and sometimes they're doing work, but sometimes they're just observing what's happening. That's an option available to you. One of the things to remember about doing observations is you get to do this thing called a thick description, where you kind of get to narrate what was happening. So let's say that you're in a sociology class and you get sent out to do field work, which will likely happen. When I was doing my human, so human psychology class, I had to eat a banana like a taco. So rather than peeling a banana and eating it, I'm sorry, like a piece of watermelon, right? Or I had to peel it and eat it down the middle. Does that make sense? People look at you really strangely when you do that. Or I had to get on elevators and stand like this. Like, rather than turning around with everyone else, I had to put my back to everyone. <laughs> Freaks people out. And then I had to write thick descriptions about how they interacted with me and how they reacted, right? So you, have to, you want to think about how what you're doing demands you to keep kind of different records. Interviews is what we're going to talk about today. This is my favorite because I like to talk, in case you haven't figured that out yet. I like to talk to people. I like to know what they think. So one of the things to remember about interviews is this is a way to talk to an expert, right? This is a way to get kind of one person's in-depth opinion about something or very specific details about your subject. So one of the things you'll have to think about is a topic that's shown up already for you twice. What makes somebody an expert? What makes somebody an authority? The thing that I'm going to ask you to remember is it's not always about degrees, right? Let's say, for example, that your 1302 class is about food. And you're having to do a food history on a dish made in your family. What's a dish? Like something that always shows up at your family meals. Like, like at Christmas or Easter or something you had this weekend because the whole family was together. Like that you'll see often in a family when you make tamales again. Okay, so if you had to do like a history of tamales in your family, Who's the expert? Where do you start? Your grandma. I'll start as in how do you make them? And yeah. But who, who are you going to go to? Who's going to know the most information about how they get made and eaten and like what's the legacy of it in your family? My grandmother. Your grandmother, right? You're not gonna, your mom may still make them, but you're not going to go to her because she's not the original, right? <laughs> Plus grandma would get mad. Grandma would get mad, right? <laughs> So you want to think about experience, right? Grandma has more experience with it. But what if you're more interested in, like, the consuming of them? Let's say that you have stopped eating tamales because of saturated fat. Like, you're, off, you're, you're a vegan, you're off the lard, you're off the fat. And so you're thinking about, like, you know, how, how are they being treated now? Would you go to your grandma? No. Who might you interview? The, like, uh, like the place where they make them. Okay, the place where you made them, or maybe you're a vegan because your cousin is a vegan too, right? And so she has some kind of expertise in nutrition that your grandma doesn't have, and that's why she's off the tamale, why you're off the tamale, why you're trying to get everybody else off it. I'm just making it up as I go along. I don't know. <laughs> but I want you thinking about those three things, education, expertise, and experience, right? When you think about who's my expert, those three things matter, right? And they may, not, they may all require different things depending on your question, what you're trying to learn. Before you do primary research, especially if you're dealing with humans, alive humans, I should say. My friend is in the history department, and she says she likes to do her research because they're all dead. It doesn't matter, right? But if you want to talk to somebody, you want to think of the ethical considerations, right? You're not actually institutionally sanctioned researchers, right? As long as you are doing research as part of your pedagogical requirement, as part of an assignment, you don't have to go get what's called institutional review board approval, right? It doesn't matter to you, but it may come up, right? You may go to talk to someone at UTPA, and they say, have you been through IRB? Before you drop your jaw and start crying in front of them, I want you to be able to say, you know what, I actually don't have to have IRB approval because this is part of my course requirement, right? That's your response if you get that question at any point. But what 
you do want to know is you want to be ethical, right? Anytime you go to talk to somebody, you need to get what's called informed consent. Your instructors can give you very specific examples of what this looks like. They can give you samples. If your instructor doesn't have it, you can come find me. I'm in the COAS building. But basically, you want to get it in writing. You either want to tell them at the beginning of your survey what question you're asking and why, so they can say, you know what, I don't like the Cardinals, so I don't want to take your survey. And you can say, well, that's fine, we're the best, so walk away, right? <laughs> or if you're going to interview them, right, you actually need their signature. And again, they need to know who you are, why you're doing it, what question you're asking, right? You can't be, you can't be all covert. We're not in the CIA. We actually have to be honest with our participants. So I want you to get it in writing. You're going to try and protect their confidentiality. Let me ask you a question. Let's say I'm doing a survey about cheating in 1302. Or how about this, texting in 1302 lectures. And I hand, hand you my survey. Will you take my survey about cheating in 1302 classes? OK. Fill it out for me. Pretend. There we go. Hand it back to me. <gasps> he texts and cheats in 1302. <laughs> Did I protect his identity? No, what could I have done? Cool. Not looked at it, but <laughs> are you not going to look at it? So what should, I, what should I have done? How can I keep myself from looking at it? Pick up everybody's at the same time, okay? Or have them drop them at the front. Have actually. them drop yeah. them at the front. Have them fold it. All really good ideas. Have them fold it and put it in an envelope. And you just hold the envelope, right? So even if you're distributing a survey, even if it's not asking something potentially scarring, like do you cheat in your class? Even if it's do you eat on campus or off campus? You always want to try and protect their identity, protect to be confidential. So you want to think of ways to do that, right? Which includes not asking for their names across the top, right? We can't ask for their names. Voluntary. I call it don't trap them in the bathroom. Right? <laughs> Participation in your projects, in your survey, in your interview, whatever. It needs to be their choice. Right? So you can't stand and block the bathroom door and say, take my survey, before you let them walk out. You can't trap them in a class. You have to give them the choice. Right? And in the same respect, you have to let them be free. If halfway through your survey, they start getting anxious and decide that they really, really, really don't want to talk about how often they cheat, then guess what? They get to wad it up and walk away. And you can't pull it out of the trash and flatten it out or iron it and turn it in. You have to just let it go. Or if in the middle of your interview suddenly they become uncomfortable when they realize that their weight is going to get upset because you're not because they're not eating her tamales anymore. Right? Because you figured out what lard is and you don't like it. Again, I'm not trying to pick on grandma. I'm just it's the example that came to mind. She's sitting right here. She gets to leave, right? So you always have to let them be free. Um, fairness is the don't wake them up in the middle of the night principle. So let's say you're doing something on sleep exhaustion, and you want to know how tired UTPA students are when they come to class. You can't call them and wake them up in the middle of the night and make them take your survey, or knock on their dorm room at 2 AM. You want to try and keep everybody at a level playing field, right? And then you always want to be honest and accurate. I make all of my students do primary research. And we talk about this ethical representation a lot because they'll take their survey, they'll distribute surveys, and then they'll be writing about the results and they'll say, well, the students were just lazy and they wouldn't answer my question. I think that's true. Were all UTPA students lazy and they just didn't want to answer that question? I guess so. Are y'all all lazy? No, right? You're in, your, you're in class. You don't have to be here. That's what the ethical representation part is about, right? Trying to be as fair and honest about who your people are, right? Being accurate. 